Eight. We are doing the book of John. I think we are on part seven. And so make sure that you have your Bibles. We are using the New King James Version. We are going to go verse by verse. For those that say, oh, Isaiah doesn't preach the Bible, blah, blah, blah. We literally go verse by verse. And so tonight is verse by verse book of John. Be excited about it. Let your kids see the excitement. Get your Bibles out. Get your highlighters out. Go with me verse by verse. I'm going to literally put it up on the screen for you. Like, I don't have a Bible. You can just stare at the screen and follow along with us. I put... I know I say this every time, so much time and energy into these verse by verse. These are the most energy and time, uh, whatever you would say, to prepare any of my content. And so I really appreciate you guys being here. I, I'm glad many of you enjoy it. I want to build a community that's based on the word of God. And without the Bible, I do not believe we'll have revival. And so we want to build our lives on God's word. We want to build it on the rock, not on the sand. So one way that we do that is by teaching verse by verse through the Bible. And then I'm going to preach it. I'm going to teach it. I'm going to talk it. We're going to go there. So hang on here. We are doing the book of John. If you don't know, the book of John was written by John. And also, if you didn't know, I've done the entire book of Revelation, Acts, Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Um, all of those are on the channel. If you want to go watch them, they're in playlists. You can watch my verse by verse. We're using the New King James Version. John wrote the book of Revelation, the book of John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So John wrote multiple books. It's believed he wrote this around 85 to 90 AD. So like 85 to 90 years after Jesus died and rose, this was written. John is my favorite gospel written. And you'll notice that John would not be considered what they call a synoptic gospel, but John takes more of a prophetic approach at most of it. He talks a lot about the deity and the divinity of Christ. And so we are going into, because we do have a lot to cover, grab your Bibles, get excited, share the broadcast. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay, Blake, just stare at the screen. I will be reading comments as we go as well. We're going into John chapter 11. The Bible says, now a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha, the town of the town. Uh, oh, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary. That seems weird. Is that right? The town of Mary? Hmm. The town of Mary. And her, okay. Maybe it just goes Lazarus of Bethany, the town of, I don't know. That, that looks weird to me. But anyways, I digress. Mary and her sister Martha. It was that, it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, the one whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that he heard that, he said, this sickness, pay attention here, is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God may be glorified through it. And again, we are seeing tough times producing great fruit. So they send this message to Jesus saying, Lazarus, our brother is sick. And I thought about when I was reading this, how often many of us don't pray which is us sending messages to jesus us petitioning jesus unless something bad happens i thought about how often we're all guilty of this we just ignore god throughout our life and then the moment someone gets sick the moment someone dies am i the only one the moment we need something we completely cry out to god ask god send god messages because we need god to fill a need but i i really believe that for this whole, this whole idea in the West of only come to God when we need him, only pray when we're sick, only cry out to him when we're desperate, only go to church when our family or friends are going through it or we're broken or going through struggles is over. The days of denying God, rebelling against God, treating and neglecting God like he's some side thing are over and God is raising up a people that say, I'm not just going to come to him when I'm sick. I'm not just going to come to him when I need a job. I'm not just going to approach him when, I, when somebody is dying in my family or when things don't go the way I wanted to go. No, we need to send messages. We need to pray. We need to seek the Lord. We need to go to church now, even in the midst of prosperity. This was a major issue throughout the Bible. When, when the people prospered, they would not seek the Lord. And then whenever they were struggling in bondage, they would cry out to God for help. And so like us, she sends Jesus a message while, he, while Lazarus is sick and dying. But sadly, many of us only cry out to God when somebody is sick and dying. And I believe that God is wanting us to pray every single day, whether things are going bad or things are going good. Choose tonight that I'm not just, and I'm guilty of this. I'm not just going to go to God petitioning and saying, God, I need something, but I'm going to have a relationship with them. Like imagine your husband or your wife only comes to you when they need something that would not feel good. That would not be good. We need to go to God for communion, for um, communing with him, for relationship, for also petitioning, also worship, also intercession, also 
in spiritual warfare, asking God to help you fight the battles, but not, not just whenever I need something. Don't be a whenever I need something Christian. Don't be a whenever I need something person where it's like, God will go to you just when I need something. So they send this message. Now, they don't just send the message, but God responds to the message. Now, the thing is, he might not respond in the way you want him to respond, but no is also an answer to prayer. Or God delaying is also an answer to prayer. And so many times we come to God in prayer, God answers by saying no, or God delays, or God doesn't do what we want him to do, and we keep praying thinking he hasn't answered. But remember, no is also an answer to prayer. So maybe some of us are praying things and God isn't giving us the answer that we want. But we don't go to God saying, God, I'm asking you to do this, but do it the way I want you to do it. If you come to God asking God to do something, expect God to do it in his way. And, and oftentimes his way is not our way. Oftentimes he doesn't do things the way we think he should do things, but we have to remember that he is God. But God does respond. God does answer. And God says Liz Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. But here's what why Lazarus got sick. Here's why it happened. For the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory for this. And the Bible says, although he loved Mary and Martha, he stayed two more days. So Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. Your family might be lost, but they're not going, it's not going to end that way. You might be sick in your body, but it's not going to end that way. You might feel lost or broken or depressed. But I want to tell you tonight, and I just want to really preach this in a prophetic way. Your story is not going to end with you being depressed. It's not going to end with you anxious. This might be a chapter, but it's not the end of the story. It's not going to end that way. Whatever you're going through, I want to tell you that there's a better ending than the ending you're currently experiencing. Maybe your family's not saved and you're telling God, God, I want you to save my family. And you're believing and you're praying and you feel hopeless and you're saying, God, why haven't you done this? But I want you to know it's not going to end with them dying and going to hell. In Jesus' name, you might be sick now. They might be sick now, but it doesn't end in death. The story isn't over. So don't give up unless God says it's over. Your, your story, your situation, your trial is not over. Somebody needs to hear this. It's not over until God says it's over. So you might be sick, but, it's, but he says it won't end in death. It won't end. Whatever I'm going through, whatever trial I'm facing, it feels like this is the end. It feels like nothing's going to change, but God has a way of stepping in at the last minute. In fact, God has a way of stepping in when it seems like there's no hope, when it seems like there's no chance, and when it seems like everything else has failed, that's the beauty of God as God steps in to get maximum credit and maximum glory. And so he says it happens so that the son will receive glory. Why does it seem that God allows bad things to happen to good people? It's so oftentimes he can receive the glory. We just read about the story last week of the man that was born blind. And they say, Jesus, why was this man born blind? And then Jesus says, so that God's power and God's glory can be shown through this man. So oftentimes God will allow things to happen that might seem bad in our eyes, but so that God can turn them around and receive maximum glory, maximum honor. Again, that doesn't make sense, brother. Well, you're not God. You're not God. God is God and he can do what he wants to do. There are so many things I did before I was saved that I don't understand why I did or why I went through or why I experienced. And I said, God, why? But I realize now I'm able to stand up and testify that I was addicted. I was hopeless. I was lost. I was broken. And all the bad stuff I went through, God has a way of turning it around for good and using it as a testimony. Maybe you went through something terrible growing up or you're going through something terrible now and you're saying, God, why, how could you possibly vindicate me and use this? And God says, I'm gonna turn around. I'm gonna use it for my glory so that you can testify to the goodness of God. So we know sickness is not from God, but Lazarus is sick and God is saying he's sick so that I can show a mighty miracle that's going to change thousands of lives. Not only you're gonna see a ripple effect from chapters 11 through 12, but even today, people still tell the story of Lazarus. Tonight, we are thousands of years later telling the story of Lazarus and faith is going to arise. People are going to get stirred up tonight as we preach the word of God. And you might experience the power of God even through the story of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Let's go to verse 5 and 6. Now, Jesus loved Mary and Mar Martha and her sister. Jesus excuse me, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Sometimes the New King James or the King James doesn't word it the way we would write a sentence, but you know, that's why sometimes I'm stumbling here. So the Bible emphasizes Jesus loved them. 
So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. So his delay was not because he doesn't love you. His delay is because his plan is bigger than your plan. His delay is not because he doesn't want to move in your life, not because he doesn't want to touch your life, not because you've done something wrong. Jesus doesn't respond right away because it's not the right time. And I love how the Bible emphasizes Jesus loved them. Because you might think, God, you don't love me. Why haven't you healed my body? Why haven't you restored my marriage? Why haven't you delivered me? Why are you delaying? Oftentimes, faith doesn't die on the operating table. Faith dies in the waiting room. We often die not while God's doing the work, but our faith dies while we're waiting for God to do the work. And I've learned to praise God even in the waiting room. Praise God even in the hallway. We talk about God opening doors, but we have to learn to worship in the hallway. Before he opens up the door, we have to learn to praise him in the waiting room. Maybe right now God's delayed and you're confused tonight saying, why haven't you moved in my life? Why haven't you healed my body? Why is my marriage still the way it is? I've seen everyone else's kid get saved. Yet why are my kids not saved? And understand it's not because God doesn't love you. It's not because God doesn't have power. Sometimes you have to thank God for not showing up. Because when God shows up, it's going to be for his maximum credit and maximum glory. It's not because he doesn't love you. It's not because he doesn't care about you. It's because he's getting ready to do something bigger than you were even asking for. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably, immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. So what Paul is saying to the church of Ephesus is God is able to do more than you can measure and he does it more than you can ask or imagine. So imagine your wildest dreams of what you'd want God to do in your, in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your ministry. And the Bible says God doesn't just do what you ask. He does immeasurably. You can't measure it more than you can ask or imagine. I, I remember times of my mom saying, man, Isaiah, I prayed for you that you would just go to church and you just you know pray the sinner's prayer. And I just wanted my kids in church. But God doesn't just answer my mom's prayer, send me to church. God answers my mom's prayer, brings me to church, radically changes my life, and then uses me to be a preacher of his gospel. My mom prayed, God, I just want my son saved in church. And God said, I'm going to do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. So don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Don't lose faith just because you are seeing a delayed promise. A delayed promise is not a no just because you haven't seen it. So what do we do during the delay? We continue to pursue God. We continue to pray. We continue to petition him. We continue to, am I preaching to anybody type one in the chat? We continue to cry out. My kid's not saved. God, you said you were going to save my kid. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep fasting. I'm going to keep coming to the house of God. I'm going to keep crying out to God. I'm going to keep worshiping God. Lord, you are worthy. Even when I don't see my miracle, I'm praising you. Even when my kids are lost, I'm praising you. I'm going to worship like you've already done it. I'm going to believe with faith. I'm going to come boldly before your throne. I'm going to worship in the waiting room. I'm going to praise in the hallway. I'm going to cry out to God. You might feel discouraged tonight. You might feel dismayed, disillusioned. You might have fear. You might be waiting for a deliverance. Why is everyone else getting delivered but me? Why does it feel like God's always delayed? But friend, I want to tell you that God knows that his timing is perfect. God knows that he's getting ready to receive maximum glory for what he's do doing in your life. So don't be dismayed. Don't be stressed out. Hang on to Ephesians 3.20. He's able to do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. So he's not just going to answer my prayer. He's going to do immeasurably, immeasurably more than I can ask or imagine. And how is he going to do it? According to his power. According to his power that's working in us. So just look at what God has done in your life already. If he's done it once, could he not do it again? Sometimes I pray for the impossible. And I'm going like, this is so easy for God. God's done it once. He can do it again. Is anything too hard for the God that we serve? Absolutely not. God can do it again. Now, Jesus tells them that this won't end in death. Why? Because believers don't experience death. We might die, but we don't experience death. Remember, death means to be separated from something. So death is separation from God. When the unbeliever dies, okay, they die. That's a physical separation from the soul, from the body, they taste death. 
And when they taste death, when they're thrown into hell, that's separation from God. So he says it's not going to end in death because believers don't experience death. We no longer experience the sting of death because when we die, we are born into heaven. We are placed beef with God in heaven. We, we are not going to taste the sting of death. The Bible says if you believe in Christ, you will never die and you will live even after dying. So we might die, but we don't experience death. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you can be sure that the moment you close your eyes and your heart stops, you will get life and you will get life more abundantly in heaven with God. This is the promise to those that believe in the name of Jesus. This is the promise to those that follow Jesus. This is the promise to those that are believers. We don't taste death. So the sickness doesn't end in death. He wasn't lying. Lazarus, we know the story, is going to die, but it's not going to end in death. What an amazing day it will be when life on earth ends. What an amazing day it'll be when Isaiah Saldivar breathes his last breath on earth and my life starts in heaven and I stand before God. For the unbeliever, death is absolutely terrifying. But for the believer, what more is there beautiful than when we leave this life and enter new life in Christ and we're with our Savior for all of eternity for a trillion times a trillion years right with our Savior. How beautiful that will be. And that's why the book of Hebrews says Christ has delivered us from the fear of death. And maybe you're a new believer. I got great news for you tonight. There's nothing to be afraid of when you die. Actually, the best thing that can happen to you is for you to die because the moment you leave this earth, you'll be with God in eternity. What a beautiful thing to live even after death. So I have no fear of death. I'm ready at any moment. Live your life ready for the next life. Live your life ready for eternity. Live your life ready to be with Christ. Don't live your life squandering things here and planning 40, 50 years. Live your life like at any moment you can be standing with God in eternity. Because that's really, friend, that's really how fragile our life here is. Let's go to verse 7. Then after he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea, Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews st sought to stone you and you're going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said after he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. When the disciples heard, said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking a rest in his sleep. So basically the disciples say, Jesus, they're trying to stone you and you're going to go there again. But here's what you need to realize. When you really get saved, when you really walk in the power of God, when God lights a fire in you, you can go back to the places that the devil tried to kill you. You can go back to those areas that God brought you out of and bring people out and not be afraid. The places the devil tried to destroy you, you can go back. Just like God brought Moses out, God brought Moses back in. He ended up being in exile from Egypt. He went back to Egypt, the place that he, he fled from, and God used him to deliver his others out of that. Just like the man at the tombs. He left the city, was out the tombs. He gets delivered. He goes back to the city and he brings up the people that he used to torment into the gospel message. So oftentimes God will bring you out of something, take the fear away from you, bring you back there to bring others out. So Jesus had no fear. They said, they're going to go stone you. We cannot be afraid as believers of places that are hostile to the gospel. We cannot be afraid of going to places that they openly reject God. We cannot be afraid of going places where we know they don't want us there. We cannot be afraid of going into places where there are sick people, where there are dying people, in those places that need healing and need breakthrough. And if they kill us, like I said, that's a shortcut. Death is only graduation. So Jesus did not have fear of them. And remember, the religious people were the ones that wanted to kill Jesus. This is often true today. Religious people will always try to kill the thing that God is doing. Religion wants to kill the move of God. But Jesus is not afraid of the religious people. Rules can't stop him. Traditions don't scare him. If Jesus is not intimidated by religious rules, it doesn't matter who comes against him, what religious people try to shut him down. When God desires and chooses to move, no religion is going to stop what God is doing. So we have to stop with, the, oh, my church is religious. God can't move. Friend, religion can't stop a move of God. We know religion wants to persecute the move of God. And you can tell right now, the Jesus Revolution movie comes out. 
the Asbury revival is happening. You want to know who's religious and who's not? Look at the people that are negative about Asbury. Look at the people that are negative about the Jesus revolution. Look at the people that are negative about come out in Jesus name movie. Look at the people that are negative about the chosen coming out in theaters. All these people that are negative about these moves of God, they're always hyper critical. People are getting killed, delivered, blind eyes are being opened, marriages are being restored. Young people are worshiping God. Young people that were just at a beer pong yesterday, partying, drinking at the rave at the club. They're lining up to worship and then all the religious Pharisees come crawling out of their holes saying, oh, this must not be a real revival. And are you sure they're preaching every 30 minutes? And are you sure this is that? And are they letting this people? And we got to make sure, you know, they let so-and-so. It's like, dude, they were blind and now they see. And you're worried about breaking the Sabbath? You're worried about, oh, well, you know, we don't know if you should be doing that. How long ago? It's like, man, all these religious Pharisees that couldn't experience God if he was standing right in front of them are so afraid of what God is doing. Pastors, leaders, stop being afraid of the move of God. I don't know why I'm not seeing a move of God at my church. Maybe because you're afraid of the move of God. Maybe because you persecute the move of God. Maybe because you're hypercritical about everything God is doing. It's time to wake up and say, I'm, I'm tired of living my life persecuting the move of God. Don't hesitate. Go experience revival. I don't know why we're like, we just really need to be careful. What? That young people are worshiping? Young people are worshiping. The gospel is being proclaimed. And I praise God for it. Is everything perfect? No. But guess what? I would rather walk on the water than be dry in the boat. Some of you are so crusty, dusty, and dry. It's no wonder why. It's no wonder why nobody wants to come to your dry, dead church. You're always negative. Everything's negative. Every Christian thing that comes out, you're negative about. Embrace what God is doing. Maybe it doesn't look like the denomination that you were raised in. Maybe it doesn't look like the church that you are. My church, well, praise the Lord, we're not at your church. Because at your church, miracles don't happen. Young people aren't excited. The dead aren't raised. The sick aren't healed. Revival's not breaking out. No one's passionate. Everything's dry and dead. We need to get back to seeking God, crying out to God. So these religious people absolutely wanted to kill Jesus. And Jesus goes, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. So when you have the light, you should not be tripping and stumbling all the time. We have the gospel. We have the light of the world. We don't stumble. We don't fall like the world does. The things that trip up the world, they don't trip us up. The things that hinder and distract the world, they don't distract us. The pitfalls that distract them, they don't distract us. The things that make them angry, sad, depressed, and in fear, they don't make us like that because we have the light of the world. Friend, when you get saved, the light turns on and you go, this is real. Like I'm born again. Everything's new for the first time. So I don't understand this, how we're walking in the light, but we're still living in darkness. And the Bible says, if you say you have the light, but you walk in darkness, the truth is not in you. So guys, we have to get over this every few days, stumbling and falling. I fell again. I fell again. It's like, man, have you been born again? Do you walk in the light? This is not legalism. So many of us live in darkness, but Jesus says, I'm going to go wake him up. Jesus is the one that has the power to wake people up. The light is what wakes people up. It's like when you wake up in the morning, you're going like, wow, what time is it? The devil wants to keep you sleeping. The devil wants to keep you dry and dead. It's time to wake up. Stumbling is a sign you're walking in darkness. If you're always stumbling, you're walking in darkness. If you're always falling all the time, you're walking in darkness. You cannot wake anyone up if you're asleep still. This is why we urgently need voices like John the Baptist to preach this message. Wake up. Wake your spirit up and call upon the Lord. It's time to wake up. It's time to break out in revival. The time is now. The, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Put on the armor of light. Wake out of your slumber. I, I wish I could shake some of you. It's time to wake up. It's time to pray. It's time to fast. It's time to seek the Lord until he comes. From this is the time to do it. Don't wait any longer. You said yesterday you were going to get right with God. You said yesterday you were going to get on fire. Now's the time. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm. Wake up. Wake up, O oh sleeper. Why are you sleeping? Why do you still have pride in your life? 
Why are you the way you are? Why are you still irritated at everything? Why do you gossip and slander? And you keep going back to porn and your old habits. And you have all these signs you're walking in darkness. You're not in the light. It's time to turn on the light. It's time to stop walking like the Pharisees walked in darkness, claiming to have the light of God. The disciples say this, if he's, if he's asleep, he will wake up. There's no need to go wake him. The disciples wanted to take the responsibility of waking people up off of their shoulders. So they said, he'll be fine. If he's sleeping, he'll wake up on his own. And this is how we are in the church. We see sleeping Christians and sleeping people and we say, we don't need to confront them. We don't need to tell them about Jesus. They'll get saved. Let me ask you this. If you don't preach to your family, who's going to? If you don't do deliverance on your family, who's going to? If you don't pray and cry out and intercede on behalf of your family, who's going to? Are they just going to wake up by themselves? We're just like the disciples. Oh, no worries, Jesus. If he's sleeping, he'll wake up on his own. We don't need to wake him up. Stop saying you don't need to wake up your family. Stop saying someone else will wake them up. Somebody else will do this. See, they didn't realize that he was actually dying. He was actually going to die. And you maybe don't realize that your family's all dead. That they are, if they die in this earthly body, now spiritually they're dead, they will be separated with, from God and you won't have a chance to preach to them. So we need to stop being lazy and we need to get bold and being willing to wake up believers that are sleeping. Wake up family members that are dry and dead. Like, who cares what they think about you? At least you're bold enough to share your faith. I wish I had a family member that would have shared their faith boldly with me. So don't be afraid to open up your mouth and speak the word of God to your friends and family. Jesus basically says, because they're not catching the drift, Jesus says, basically, he's dead. In other words, a believer who's asleep is no different than someone that's dead. You might have heard the gospel a million times, or your family might have, and they might still die and go to hell. They might still be asleep. This is no joke. This is no game. We need to be awake. We cannot be sleeping Christians. We cannot be dead and dry Christians. We cannot let our comfort zones stop us from sharing our faith. Look at verse 14. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Okay, y'all aren't catching it. Sleeping and death are the same. Being dead and being asleep are the same. Both equate to the same thing. And then he says, and I'm glad for your sake I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. What a statement. We're going to talk about that. What a statement. Jesus says, I'm glad for your sake I wasn't there. Because later we're going to see Jesus absolutely upset, angry, the Bible says, in his spirit about their unbelief. So much unbelief, Jesus gets angry later. He says, I'm glad I wasn't there. I wonder how many pastors on judgment day, Jesus is going to say, I'm glad I wasn't there at your church. When you didn't pray for the sick when you didn't cast demons out of those that were broken, when you didn't preach the true, undignified, un, uh, unfiltered, unadulterated word of God. I'm glad I wasn't there when people were dying and going to hell in your church. Jesus told the disciples, I'm glad I wasn't there for your sake. I'm glad I wasn't. So oftentimes people get offended. Oftentimes people get mad. Oftentimes pastors don't like it. But you know what? I want Jesus. I don't want Jesus to say, I'm, I'm glad for your sake I wasn't there in your church, amongst you, among the believers. I mean, this is crazy. He says, I'm glad for your sake I wasn't there, that you may believe. Because now you're going to see an even greater miracle. And then Thomas says, let's go die with him. This is the attitude of a true believer. Most Christians think you're insane when you say you're willing to die for God. But understand, you're in, what's insane is to live a Christian life a God who already died for us and not be willing to lay everything down for him. Now, some of you are like, Jesus, I'll die for you, but we don't even live for him. So if we're not willing to live for him, I can promise you, you're not willing to die for him. I do believe it's time to come out of the closet and to start boldly proclaiming the gospel and say, even if they kill us, I'm still going to share my faith. And in fact, there's people in this chat that are in other parts of the world where they will kill you for sharing the gospel and they still continue to share the gospel. But for I'm telling you, when you've given everything up, when God has radically changed your life, when you've experienced the power and the fire of the Holy Ghost, when God breaks into your life and makes himself real to you, you have no problem dying for the gospel. You have no problem losing your head for this thing. And so that, that's a testament to the trueness of the gospel is that people are willing to die for this thing and people are dying all over the world. In fact, if you're not being persecuted, you are in a, you are in a minority right now. You are not the majority. 
the majority of the church is being persecuted right now as we speak for the gospel that we freely have and freely don't share. Verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that it had already been in the tomb for four days. Tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met with him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. How many times have we said that? How many times? We're, we're going to preach it. How many times have we said, Lord, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. But even now I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection in the last days. Jesus said to her, so she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then this is one of my favorite lines in the whole Bible, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, so you may die, which is physical, physical, he shall live. So how could you die and also live because you don't experience death? Look at this. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You will never taste death. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into the world. So notice what Jesus says here. Jesus gets to Bethany. Lazarus has been dead for four days. And Jesus tells Martha, your brother will rise again. After he's already been dead, it seems like nothing more. Am I preaching to anybody? It seems like nothing more can be done in the situation. And Jesus says he will rise again. And she responds, yes, in the last day he will with everyone else. In other words, I believe God for my salvation. that One day I'll go to heaven, but I don't believe for healing and resurrection right now. This is where a lot of religious people are. They believe they're going to die in the resurrection, go to heaven, be, ra be raised again, but they don't believe for healing right now. We believe he saves, but we don't believe he heals. And this blows my mind that we believe we're going to go to heaven, but we don't believe we could have heaven right now. We don't believe we could have the miracle power of God. And I want to tell you that God still heals. God can still drive out demons. God can still create bones and eardrums and eyeballs and whatever you need. The Western church believes God can save but they don't believe in the power of God right now. And as the disciples show, as the book of Acts show, our God is alive and well. Now is the day of salvation. God is still healing. God is still delivering and God is still being breakthrough right now. And the, the, and the truth is Martha did not realize that Jesus is, was, and will always be God. She knew he had power. She knew he did miracles. She knew he was a prophet. She knew all about him, but did not really know him as God. And I want you to know that Jesus is God. He can do all things. We don't just want to know about him. We want to know him. So when you get to know Jesus by spending time with him in his word and in prayer, you'll no longer doubt his power. You will no longer doubt his ability to save your family. You'll no longer doubt his ability to use you despite all of your dysfunctions. You'll no longer doubt his ability to heal those that are sick, raise those that are dead, and cast out those demons of the people that are demonized. Jesus, 100% God, was there in the beginning. The word made flesh dwelled among us, created the known universe, will be there on judgment day. The one that you will experience and see at the right hand of the father, Jesus is God. We see this all throughout this. And then Jesus says, Martha, do you believe this? Jesus told Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Do you believe this? That's my question to you tonight. Do you believe this, that God can heal? that God can deliver, that your marriage isn't too far? Do you believe that God can provide for your family? Do you believe that God can raise up that kid that's spiritually dead that you've been praying for? Do you believe that he is the alpha, the omega, the beginning? Do you believe all the promises that we see in the word of God? Or do are we these Christians that live our lives in unbelief, live our lives in doubt, and believe one day we're going to heaven, but we don't believe God is active moving in the earth right now as I speak? God can do it. Now, there was an ideology in the day that the people believed. And this is what they believed in those days. This is historical, that your spirit would hover for three days. When you died, your spirit would hover for three days. So Jesus waits till the fourth day to remove anyone else from getting credit from this situation. He gets there four days later, not by accident, to make sure no one gets credit for what I'm about to do. Because if he healed him in two days, people could say, oh, his, his spirit was floating around for two days, returned back to his body, because that's what they believed in those days. But God says, I'm going to wait to step in until 
man's resources, ideas are exhausted. And when I do this, no one else can take glory. I will not share my glory with anyone. Why does God take people like me who is an atheist? Why does God take those that are drug addicts and been delivered and those that are alcoholics that have been delivered and use them to change the world? Why does God take the least qualified, the unqualified, uh, choose somebody from a small town in the middle of California like me? Why does God do this? I'll tell you why. Because he wants to make sure no one gets credit. He wants to make sure they look, they look at us and say, that could have only been God. Only God could have done what he's done in your life. No one else could have done in my life what God did. They can look at me and say, that must be God. To take a depressed, bitter, angry atheist and use him as a preacher. To take someone like you in the chat that was beat down, broken, busted, and disgusted. That was addicted, that was hurting, that was lost. And God has turned your life around. And now people say, wait a minute. I know you. There's no way church did that. That must have been God. There's no way anyone else could have done it. Won't he do it? Wasn't it God that you were blind and now you see? No other person could have done that. So Jesus strategically waits until no one else can do it but me. So if you feel like God has an answer to promise or done what you think he should do, maybe God's waiting until no one else will get credit. Maybe if God does it right now, you can get the credit. Maybe if God does it right now, other people will, will be glorified in it. But God says, nobody will get credit for what I'm going to do in your life. Nobody will get credit for what I'm going to do in your kid's life. Nobody will get credit for what I'm going to do in your marriage. Nobody will get credit for what I'm going to do in your body. He waits until the fourth stage of cancer. He waits until the fourth day he's been dead. He waits until the fourth, the last final inning and God shows up. If you feel like it's too late, it's probably the perfect time for God to do something. If you feel like God's delayed, it's probably the perfect time for God to do, do, do something. And that's exactly what we're seeing in this story. Okay, but we can't go all night here. So let's keep moving. Verse 28. And when she had said these things, she went on her way and secretly called Mary saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. Which again, doesn't recognize who he truly is. Still calling him the teacher. As soon as she heard that, she arose and quickly came to him. Now Jesus had not come into the town, but was in the place where, Mary, where Martha met him. Verse 31. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out and followed her, saying, she's going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now again, I want to also make the point of what we read earlier. If you were only here, if you would have been there, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you were only here, if you had only been there, this would have never happened. If only, if only, if only. Isn't this something that we live in today? Lord, if you would only, why is it God always gets the blame? Why is it that Martha is willing to blame Jesus and say, if you would have only been here, if you would have only, my brother would have not died. Why is Mary and Martha so willing to say this? If you were only there, my dad would have never died, Jesus. If you were only there, that person would have never sexually abused me. If you were only there, this would have never happened. If you were only there, fill in the blank, I wouldn't have lost my job. But I want to tell you, God was there. You probably just didn't call on him. How is it we blame God for stuff that it was in our past? When we ignored God, we didn't call upon him. We rejected him. But then we say, Lord, if you were only there. I really do believe we should stop blaming God for every bad thing in our life. There is a real devil. There is a real prince of demons, real demons that want you dead. There is real evil, real sickness, and God is not the one causing all this evil stuff. So before you point your finger at God, would you consider that there's a real devil that's out to still kill and destroy? So we need to throw out the ifs. Ifs will haunt you. Ifs will haunt you. If I only raised my kids this way, if I only did this in grade school, if I only didn't go there, if I only prayed before the situation, if I only didn't make that decision when I was 19, I wouldn't be going through what I'm going through now. If I only didn't let that person use me, abuse me, and break me down the way they did. If, if, if. We cannot live our lives in the ifs. The if realm. You can spend the rest of your life letting the ifs of what could have happened and what didn't happen. Or you can say, it doesn't matter. What matters is, Jesus is here now, and he's ready to do something. He's ready to heal. He's ready to change. So, if you don't get anything tonight, get the if out of your life. Get rid of the if only. If I only prayed that way. If I only had 
what Isaiah had, if I only had the page that Isaiah had, if I only had the resources that Isaiah had, if I only had the talent that so-and-so had. It's like this ifs all day, but stop with the ifs and say, now is the day. God is here now. Things can change right now. Look at this. Look what happens in verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, we got to move along here. And the Jews came with her weeping. He groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. This is the shortest verse in the Bible. Verse 35. I want to read you that uh, chapter 11, verse 33 in the NLT. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. The deep anger was their unbelief. Their unbelief that God couldn't do what they should have known he can do. And some of us need to repent tonight for not believing that God can do what he said he can do in his word. If God said it, God can do it. If God said he can heal, if God said he can deliver, we don't need to argue or debate. God can do it. So he wept. He was greatly troubled. There was unbelief in their heart. And people have speculated why he wept forever. But I believe that he was angered and stirred because of their unbelief, because they were weeping and wailing rather than calling out to him and saying, Lord, we know you can do this. We have faith. Jesus, we have faith that you can raise him from the dead. We know you're not just a healer, but you just said you're the resurrection and the life. You can raise him. So this is a tough situation here. Verse 36. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also kept this man from dying? So again, they're blaming, projecting this on the Jesus saying, why didn't Jesus do this? Verse 36. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 37, verse 38. Then Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. And there is a, uh, a Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench for he's been dead four days. It's like, come on, that's the least. That's the least of our concerns here. Jesus said to her, did I not say to, the, to you that if you would believe you would see, you would see the glory of God? So her concern is the smell is terrible. That's, that's her concern. And that's sadly our concern with the world. They smell bad. We don't want to hang out with them. They drink. They cuss. They're bad. They're sinners. Jesus says, go among the dead, raise the dead, bring the gospel, bring the message. And instead of being concerned with our friends and family are dying and going to hell, the people around us are dying. We're like, oh, they cuss. Oh, they're bad. Oh, they watch bad movies. They're lost. They're dead, of course. The answer isn't, oh no, they cuss. The answer is, of course they cuss. Of course they're hurt. Of course they're broken. Of course they curse at God and hate God. I was cursing at God the night I got saved and that didn't stop God from sa saving me. So sometimes we let, we let the stench of their deadness stop us from really going after God. The issue is not the stench, Martha and Mary. The issue is he's dead. That's the problem. He needs resurrection power. Verse 31. Then they took away the stone in the place from where the dead man was laying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you will always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he said these things, he cried a loud voice. And this is what he cried. For those of you that are like, I don't know why you have to be so loud. He shouted, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Friend, notice the Bible doesn't say Jesus whispered. Notice the Bible doesn't say Jesus was quiet. When you're really desperate, when you really want dead things to come back to life, sometimes you need to shout. Sometimes you need to let the devil know. You've messed with me long enough, devil. Enough is enough. I'm not going to be silent about it. I'm not going to be quiet about it. There are too many quiet Christians. People are like, why do you always shout? And I'm like, well, if the church wasn't so dead, I wouldn't have to shout. But I believe the deeper the church sleeps, the louder God is going to shout. The deader the church is, the louder Jesus is going to shout. Dead things, write this down. Dead things respond to loud noises. Sometimes you got to shout. And then Jesus says, unwrap him. So we have to be willing when people come back to life, to unwrap them of their of their grave clothes, of their old identity, of the old things they used to do. So we don't just want to see people come back to life, and that is spiritually they go from being dead to alive. So your family member gets saved, they go from death to spiritually being resurrected from the dead, 
Now you're going to have to help them get their grave clothes off. They can't do it themselves. Excuse me. You're going to have to help disciple them. So don't preach resurrection to people, but not be willing to help them get their dirty grave clothes off. Hey, I might, I might have to stay up late at night discipling them. I might have to be there with them. Now they have no friends. So I might have to be that friend. I might have to go out of my way to help them unwrap those grave clothes. Because we don't just want you resurrected. We want that old man to be taken off. We want that old nature. So Jesus said, how unwrap him. And how, how nasty and messy was it to unwrap him? Some of you are going to get unwrapped tonight. Some of you have been wrapped up in depression. You've been wrapped up in anger. You've been wrapped up in anxiety. You've been wrapped. What are you wrapped up in? And tonight, we're going to help unwrap you. And it's smelly. It's nasty. It takes work. Some people don't do deliverance and they talk bad about it because they don't want to put the work in. Deliverance, unwrapping people, loosing them. And I love the wording Jesus uses. Look at this. This is the same thing that we do in deliverance. Loose him and let him go. When we're doing deliverance, we're praying that God would release people from the demonic bondage. So it takes time. And I, I, I thought about what would, what would be the first thing a dead man would say? How excited would Lazarus be? How, how, if you were dead and you came back to life, you wouldn't shut up about it. You would talk about it everywhere you went. You, would, you wouldn't care if people said you were too loud. You think you would care if a religious person said, maybe you shouldn't shout that loud. Maybe you, that's my religious person voice. Maybe you should calm down. Maybe you shouldn't be so loud. Would you care? You were dead and now you're alive. And this is why for me, it's like, I, I have not for one second ever cared about a religious person saying, you're too loud, brother. The veins are always popping out of your neck. I literally couldn't care less in a, fit, in a real way. I couldn't care any less than I care when religious people tell me to be quiet. I was dead. And now I'm alive. And you're going to tell me to be quiet? You're going to tell me, oh, it doesn't take all that. Maybe not for you. But for me, I was a dead man. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout. Maybe some of you will have that encounter tonight where you go from spiritual death to life. But I was dead. I was, I was worse than dead in the physical. I was worse than Lazarus. I wasn't physically dead. I was spiritually dead. Separated from God. And God came to me and changed my life. So yes, shout about it. Scream about it. Be excited about it. The devil is a liar. Give him a migraine with your shout. Give him a migraine with your praise. Get loosed. Get loosed from the opinions of men. Verse 45. We won't go, we'll go through these. These won't take long here. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. So they saw what he did. Why did they believe in him? They seen the things that Jesus did. Don't tell me miracles don't matter. Don't tell me, oh, we don't need miracles, brother. That was for the you know, apostolic age. And that was for the past, the disciples to establish the gospel. And now that his gospel's here, well, people still need to believe in him. And they believed in him based on what they had seen, the things they seen. Is it possible that if we lay hands on the sick, if we cast out devils and people see miracles, they might believe? Of course it is. Verse 46. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. We got some snitches out here. Some of you in the chat right now are little snitches. You get my content, you go take it to the heresy hunters. Okay, I, 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 could, I could fill it here. I could, I, I could totally relate to this. They told them the things that Jesus did. That's a joke, by the way, but it's serious. Verse 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. Even the Pharisees. Look at this. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. So we got to stop these miracles. We got to stop these deliverances. We got to stop this resurrection power because if we don't, everyone's going to believe in him. So is it possible by depriving people from seeing the miraculous, we deprive them the chance of believing in him? How is it these Pharisees know more than we do about the power of signs and wonders and miracles? And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. Verse 49. Man, these Pharisees are salty up in here. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest this year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that is ex expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. So he wants to kill Jesus. That's what this means. He's trying, I'm gonna, I want to kill Jesus. Now, now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Verse 53. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. 
So from that day forward, because of what he did with Lazarus, they want to kill Jesus. That's the goal. The goal is to kill Jesus. Verse 54. Therefore, Jesus no longer walk, walked openly among the Jews, but went from the end of the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. So, if you don't want to see miracles, if you want to kill the move of God, if you don't want to see Jesus doing miracles and raising the dead, this is what you can expect Jesus to do. That's what you, pastor, leader, okay, I'm preaching strong. If you don't like the supernatural, if you hate the miracles, if you hate when people get raised from the dead, if you're angry about revival, if you're negative about all the revivals, if you're constantly criticizing every move of God that you're not a part of, this is what you can expect Jesus to do. No longer walk openly among you. I mean, really, I don't know why Jesus doesn't show up at my church. Maybe because you don't like him there. Maybe because you hate what he does. When Jesus shows up in the Bible, demons were cast out and miracles broke out. You don't like deliverance and you don't like miracles. You don't even believe they're for today. So do not get mad that Jesus doesn't openly walk among you. Jesus doesn't move in your church. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? So they're, they're trying to set him up. They're waiting for him. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report that they might seize him. So understand that Jesus is walking among these people openly, now he's no longer. He, now he has to do it in secret because he's, he's worried that they're going to try to kill him before his time. And remember, nobody kills Jesus. Jesus freely lays down his life. Let's go into verse 12 here, or chapter 12. We won't finish the whole chapter because we've already been live an hour and 10 minutes. And I do have an engagement after this that I have to get set up for for tomorrow's in-person podcast. But let's just go a few verses here and just key on this one story. Uh, chapter 12. Then six days before the Passover. So we know Passover is getting ready to start. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Now, this is a celebration supper from what happened with Lazarus. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. So notice G Mary anointed Jesus. There's another story of this that goes into greater detail on uh, in Matthew but the only reason why you would anoint someone or something was anointing them king and there is a lot of Christians where Jesus is their Messiah he's their teacher he's their friend their comforter their savior their healer their love but you've never anointed Jesus king and what Mary decided to do is Mary said I'm not going to wait for Jesus to anoint me because that's what a lot of us want. We want the anointing of God. We preach, we want God to anoint us. But Mary said, I'm going to anoint Jesus. I'm going to anoint him as a king. And Mary saw something that no one else saw. She saw that Jesus was going to the cross and got a very costly, costly box of perfume. Now, before Jesus can become your king, you have to break your box. She had to break the box of perfume to anoint Jesus king. And many of us are trapped in a religious box. We're, we're in the same, we do the same thing. We're not willing to get uncomfortable. We're not willing to break the mold. We're not willing to break and bend and walk on water. So we go in circles, but you have to choose if you're going to anoint Jesus, the king of your life. And now he's going to tell me what to do. You have to break your religious box. You have to say tonight, I'm tired of this box. I'm tired of this mold. It's time to break the box you've put God in. It's time to break the box you've been in. It's time to anoint Jesus as your king tonight. Jesus, you are not just my Messiah or my savior, but you are my king. You're not just the king of kings. You're my king. You're my savior. You're my ruler. You choose what I do. And the Bible says when she broke it, it filled the house with fragrance sacrifice and worship and passion and zeal is attractive and it will attract people to God. It will draw people. It's an aroma to God when you sacrifice. And so the question would be in this story, very short story is have you given God something that really cost you something? This was no doubt her most prized possession. In fact, scholars say it was a year's wages, a year's wages. And she was willing to give up a year's wages and pour it out before Jesus sacrifice it before Jesus. And God is saying, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to break? She was willing to lay it all down, even though we're about to see she's going to get persecuted for it. Verse four, 
But one of his disciples, look at this, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray, said, why was this oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to, he used to take what was put in it. So here you have a man. Now in Matthew, Matthew has an account of the story. And in Matthew's account, it says that the disciples got angry that she poured this oil on Jesus. And in Matthew's account, this is what the disciples said. Why would you waste this on Jesus? Or what was the purpose of this waste? Have you ever had other Christians tell you that what you're doing for God is a waste of time? You don't have to praise that way. That's a waste. You don't have to pray that much. That's a waste. I have friends and family that right now truly believe with everything in them that I'm wasting my life. They truly believe. There are, there are many people that look at my life and I preach full time. This is all I do. They look at my life and say, man, that guy's so gifted. That guy's so smart. They say all these things about me and they say, what a waste of life. What a waste of life that Isaiah uses his life to preach on the internet and travel go to these churches. What a waste of life. He could have got a great job, got his good, good degree, be making a ton of money per year, had all, built a business, been an entrepreneur, built a kingdom for himself. But the world and religious Christians look at my life or your life and say, what an absolute waste. Why are you wasting your time at prayer? Why are you, am I preaching to anybody tonight? Why are you wasting your time fasting? Why are you wasting your time going to those revival meetings? You're in church three to four times a week. What a waste of life. You could be doing 10 other things. But friend, we know exactly what we're doing. We know that nothing is wasted on our God. That we are willing to lay everything down for the God that laid everything down for us. And who was mad about it? A fake disciple. A fake Christian. Judas, who was stealing money, who had his hands in the offering. The biggest hypocrite in the room was the one mad about it. So get mad all you want. I'm going to keep wasting my life on him. I'm going to keep giving you every, I'm going to keep giving him everything. I'm telling you, it's time to stop treating God like he's some minimum wage job. It's time to say, I'm going to give God more than Facebook. I'm going to give God more effort than my minimum wage job. I'm going to give God more affection than I give Instagram. I'm going to get more excited about God than anything else. I'm talking about tonight, giving God something that cost you everything. An entire year's wages, she was willing to waste it on him. And of course, the hypocrite Judas, who was stealing money, yet Jesus still let him be a part. Just because God doesn't judge your secret sin doesn't mean he doesn't know it's there. Secretly, Judas thought he was getting away from it, with it. God knows all about our secret sin. Some of you think you're getting away with it, but the Bible says in the book of Romans, one day, God will judge the secrets of men. And what you did in darkness will be brought into the light. So Judas thought he was getting away with it, but Jesus knew the entire time what he was doing. And judgment was inevitable. Let's look at verse 7 here. But Jesus said, let her alone. Some, some translations say, leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you'll have with you always, but me you do not always have. So Jesus says, leave her alone. There's a reason why she's doing what she's doing. So I have a word for all the religious counterfeit Christians tonight. Leave those alone that are willing to give more than you. Just because you're not willing to get excited, just because you're not willing to sacrifice, just because you're not willing to give your life, leave them alone. Like, leave us alone. If you do think we're crazy, let us do our thing. You can stay in your religious box and warm a chair. But why do you have to always harass those that do more than you? Why do you have to always preach to those that are more on fire than you and try to get them to become like you? She understood he was going to die and was willing to lay everything else. And they, she understood something no one else understood. And her devotion was a result of her understanding what God was doing. When you understand what God is up to, the times and the season and what God is doing, you'll have a higher level of devotion. And I think if we really knew what God was doing in this hour, how he was pouring out his spirit, how he's moving in this generation, then we would give God everything. He says, you always have the poor among, among you, but you will not always have me. We're always going to have church buildings, nice conferences, and all these things, good preachers, but we won't always have God's presence like it's being poured out right now. This is the time for the presence of God. This is the time for revival. This is the time for awakening. 
This is the time for the Holy Spirit to move in our lives and it's time to break our box, pour everything out. Maybe you're dead spiritually and God wants to revive you. No more this weak, watered down Christianity. No more. It's time to get radical. I'm blowing the trumpet tonight. I'm sounding the alarm. It's not by accident God's woke up your family for this time. It's not by accident a bunch of Christian movies are coming out. Revivals are breaking out. Deliverance movies. Deliverance movement. This is the time. Get your family together. Seek the Lord in prayer. Start having Bible studies. Go through our verse by verses. Start nights of prayer and worship. Start doing deliverance on your family. I've never seen deliverance. Start. Start. Start praying for your kids. Start casting those demons out. Start laying hands on the sick. Start proclaiming the gospel with power. There is power in Jesus' name. This is the time right now for revival. This is the time for you. Maybe you're like Lazarus, or maybe you're like Mary and Martha praying, Lord, when are you going to do it? When are you going to break out? Why haven't you done it? Why have you been delayed? This is the time. I feel the spirit of revival. I'm telling you, it's alive and well. God is moving in this generation, and I'm not going to let it pass me by. I'm willing to waste my entire life on this thing. In fact, Paul said, my life is worthless if I don't use it fulfilling the call God has given me. So the contrast is life actually has no value if you don't use it for God. Life is worthless. Life is pointless. To the world, we're wasting our life, but we know exactly what we're doing. We're giving everything for God because he's the only one worthy of laying my life down for. A career is not worthy of it. A job is not worthy of it. A boss is not worthy of it. A million dollars a year is not worthy of it. Nothing is worthy of my life being laid down for but Jesus Christ. So I'm breaking my, bo my box. I'm giving him something costly. I'm anointing Jesus. We always say, Jesus, anoint me. No, 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 no. Tonight, I'm anointing Jesus, my king. She anointed Jesus. Jesus and David were the only men in the Bible that were anointed three times. Jesus was anointed by the Father with the Holy Spirit. He was anointed by Mary. He was anointed by Nicodemus. We could anoint Jesus tonight, our King. Lord, you are my King. I make you the Lord of my life. Father, I pray over every single person listening tonight that you would bring revival life into them, God. I pray the Spirit of Almighty God would break out into their lives, Lord. I pray the fire of revival, the anointing of the Holy Spirit would touch them right now. Lord, I pray that they would wake up out of their slumber, take off the grave clothes, take off the grave clothes in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to take off the grave clothes. Help us, Lord, to remove every dead thing in our life that is not of you. God, strip us of these nasty grave clothes of shame, of guilt, of condemnation. Whatever it is, remove that old identity. Loose, be loosed from that old identity. And the Bible says, put on Christ. Put on Christ. Lord, remove these grave clothes. God, wake us up. Break that spiritual death in our lives, God. Break that spiritual death right now in our lives. Lord, drive out these unclean spirits that have wrapped around us. These unclean spirits that have weaved into our personality that Matthew 12 says, live in our house. God, drive them out tonight by the power of the Holy Ghost. Come on, chat. Get delivered. Get free. Lord, drive out sickness by the power of the Holy Spirit tonight. Deliver us, Lord. Loose us from these unclean spirits, God. Free us, God. If maybe you're dead. God can resurrect you tonight. God can resurrect you tonight. In Jesus' name, be resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, the Bible says Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come forth. And I'm telling you tonight, come forth in Jesus' name. Come forth in Jesus' name. No more death. No more spiritual death. And then some of you, Judas is in here. You keep judging everyone for their passion. Repent tonight. You need to go from being a Judas to a Peter. Repent tonight. Lord, I'm sorry for judging other people's passion. I'm sorry, God, for judging other people's worship. I'm sorry, God, for judging people that are more passionate than me and being cynical and being bitter and being some Pharisee, judging all these revivals. I don't know if this is revival or not. You've never even experienced revival. How would you know? Lord, forgive us for judging. Lord, we want to see revival. I will not be cynical for a second about revival. Lord, we want to see revival. I don't want Jesus to say, I'm no longer going to walk among you because of your cynicism. Lord, break out in our houses. Come on, chat. Pray, 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 pray. Deliver us from every unclean spirit. Free us, God.
Revive us again. Some of you, you've lost your passion. Lord, revive us again. Deliver our kids, God. Bring revival to our kids. Come on, there's 2,500 of you in here right now. This is revival happening in your house, in your family. Imagine right now, many of you have kids and, and family you're watching with. There's probably over 5,000 people in here realistically. Lord, revive us. What, what if 5,000 soldiers could rise up in the power of the Holy Ghost? Jesus says, walk in the light. Come on, we're praying the scriptures we just preached. Lord, we don't want to walk in darkness. I don't want to stumble all the time. I'm tired of stumbling. I want to walk in the light. I don't want to walk in the darkness. I want to walk in the light. Lord, help me to walk in the light. Help me to walk according to your will. Help me to walk in your spirit, God. Awaken my heart. Awaken my heart, God. Let my heart burn. Remember the, the, the disciples on the road said, did our hearts not burn when he read us the scriptures? God, let me have a burning heart on fire for you, God. Light our kids on fire. Light our marriages on fire. Light our households on fire. Set us ablaze for your honor and your glory. We are tired of stumbling in the dark. Come on, get tired of tripping all the time. Like every day we go from deliverance to deliverance, constantly falling. Lord, I want to walk in the light. Crucify that flesh tonight. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Every unclean spirit must go. Every unclean spirit must leave us now in Jesus' name. Satan, we break your contracts. We break your assignment. The blood of Jesus is against you. We uproot every demonic tie of witchcraft. We sever you now. Every spirit must go in Jesus' name. You have no power, Satan. Every religious demon up and out in Jesus' name. The blood is against you. Leave now. Loose us in Jesus' name. Be loosed in Jesus' name. Satan, you've lost this battle. These people are not your home. Pack your bags and leave now in Jesus' name. The blood is against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. Free people right now, Lord. I pray, Lord, minds would be freed. Those of you that are struggling with schizophrenia and mental illness and bipolar and a million things, 300 plus lists of mental disorders they categorize people in. We command right now everything to go now. Maybe you say, well, I just need to be healed. Well, be healed tonight in Jesus' name. Well, I need to be delivered. Well, be delivered in Jesus' name. Be healed. Depression has to go. Anxiety has to go. Fear has to go. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. So fear is a demonic spirit that God didn't give you. So who gave it to you? The devil. What spirit did God give me? Power, love, and a sound mind. Spirit of fear, go in Jesus' name. Power and love and a sound mind, come. We pray, Lord, fill us with that spirit. It's a spirit God gave us. That's what it says. Fear has to go. Fear has to go in Jesus' name. And that word fear actually means timidity. It means to be timid. No more being timid. No more being shy. No more being lukewarm. Timidity and fear has to go. In Jesus' name. Satan, you're a liar. You're the father of lies and we come against you in Jesus' name. The light of Christ exposes you. Holy Ghost, fill us tonight. I'm telling you, I just feel the fire of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, fill us tonight with your spirit. Just ask him to fill you. The Bible says if an evil parent gives good gifts, how much more does your heavenly father want to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Ask the Father for the Holy Spirit tonight. Come on. Tiredness. I'm preaching to myself, y'all. I'm tired. I'm tired for real though. I was like, oh, I don't even know if I want to get on tonight. I'm tired. But you know what? God can break that. God can fill me. God can rejuvenate me. God can refill me. So I'm not just praying for you. I'm praying with you. Lord, refill me with your Holy Spirit. Recharge me, God, with your Holy Spirit and fire. Anoint me tonight, Lord, with your Holy Spirit and fire. Do a new thing in my heart, God. Light me on fire for your gospel, God. Remove all discouragement, God, in Jesus' name. Break discouragement off of your people. Break competition off your people. Break the need to be validated off of your people. Break the people-pleasing spirit. Break it tonight, Lord, off of me, off of those in the chat. Restore us, God. Heal our bodies in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. 
Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. Do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Lord, tonight we pray. Move in signs and wonders. Break revival out in our families. Break revival out in our marriages. God, we need you. We're hungry for you. Move in this generation, God. Don't pass us by. Don't pass this generation by, Lord. But send your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can keep praying. If you're listening on audio, you can give on isaiahsalver.com slash partner. Those of you watching live, we're still going to hang out and talk and chat, but I do want to give you a chance to sow into the broadcast. We are viewer supported. So without your guys' giving, we can't do this. That's the bottom line. So if you want to give, you can. I'll read the chat now. I'll read the donations now. We'll hang out for a bit, and then I'm going to run here in a little bit here. Um, I can't go super late two and a half hours tonight because I got another engagement right after this. But man, what a great night tonight. An hour and a half. My voice is almost gone. We have a podcast tomorrow at 6 o'clock live in the new studio. There's 2,400 of you right now. Every one of you come back tomorrow. Okay? Every one of you. I'm shamelessly asking you. Come back tomorrow. I'll be getting interviewed. will be interesting because I'll be getting interviewed on my podcast, but it's going to be for a upcoming documentary on Pure Flix about deliverance. But make sure you're back tomorrow. Do not miss tomorrow at 6 o'clock. If you want to give, you can scan the QR code. Or you can give on PayPal or Venmo or Zelle. Don't be like, I don't know how to give. Find a way to give. Okay, there's pinned in the comments. That's in the description. There's no excuse to not sow into what God is doing. If you can't afford to give, then just pray for us. Just pray for us. If you can't afford to give, just pray for us. Is my camera skipping? I hope not. Technology, man. Pray for the technology too. Anonymous, thank you for the donation. Say, God bless you. Thanks for all that you do. Sharon, let me turn some music on here. Sharon uh becerra said love your ministry listen to you every night thank you sharon and thank you for listening it means a lot anonymous said ask you to pray for my future business for me and my brother we're gonna start next month i got you thank you so much anonymous all right the only ones i can read right now are the ones that give on the paypal link that is in the comments okay i can't read other ones on the website or anything till after so just because i don't read your name doesn't mean your donation didn't go through I can only read the pin comment PayPal and the Venmo right now. I don't have access to the rest until after the broadcast. All right. Not skipping. Okay, good. Maybe I'm just a nerd. Okay. Janae, thank you so much. Said my 10 year old says that these Bible verses on Monday nights with you really mean a lot to him. Thank you for all you do. You've brought revival to my household. Pray Jesus. God bless you, Isaiah. Thank you, Janae. And hello to your 10 year old. I'm so glad that you love the Monday nights. I appreciate it. Thank you, Janae. Thank you to your 10-year-old. You guys are awesome. I love the young people that follow and partner. And I'm, I pray that I could be a role model to all these young people out here. I appreciate you guys. Okay. Where's Carl? Uh, Carl is right here. He's right here. Guys, remember our deliverance documentary that we are a part of comes out next Monday. I've, I've already seen the movie. I just saw it in Nashville on Saturday. And it's absolutely amazing. You'll love the movie. It comes out on Monday, March 13th. Come out in Jesus name dot com. Uh, our movie's coming. Actually, while you guys are giving, let's play the trailer. You guys want to see the trailer to the movie? While you guys are giving, turn your attention to the screen. This is Come Out in Jesus' Name. Comes out next Monday in 2000 theaters, March 13th at 7 p.m. Get your tickets at comeoutinjesusname.com. Let's watch this. In the New Testament, is it verifiable that Christians can be attacked and oppressed by demons? Come on. God used controversy. Look, I'm on the list. He used CNN. He used the media. He used all of it to grow a massive size platform. Controversy built our platform. Two genders. It was never about the controversy. It was never about the politics. I thought it was. I thought it was about Trump. I thought it was about COVID. But God built our platform for deliverance. We are headed more into seeing prophecy fulfilled before our very eyes. There's a kingdom of righteousness and there's a kingdom of darkness. Something in our being craves something supernatural. If you're addicted to something, you have company. And he said in the last days, the church will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. They will begin to listen to demonic doctrines. He doesn't mind you going to church. He doesn't mind you praising as long as you don't change. There's a great awakening that is coming. The kingdom of God is not about talk. Jesus is king! 
It's about power and demonstration. The state of the church in the United States, I believe, needs a reawakening of deliverance because of the evil that's going around. Christians can be under the influence of satanic oppression. 100% they can. You see, redemption and salvation is for the lost. Deliverance is to set the captives free. The Word of God says, these signs shall follow them that believe. Kind of the enemy is to keep the church quiet. Deliverance is for the people of God. Deliverance is for the church. I'm here to call this culture to Jesus Christ and cast out demons. Because these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. There it is, March 13th in 2000 theaters. And at the end of the movie, for 30 minutes, Pastor Greg is going to be live streaming into all theaters, praying mass deliverance and salvation, a salvation message at the end. So 2000 theaters, lots of people are going to get delivered. It's going to be amazing. You don't want to miss that. I'll have a meetup in Manteca, California. The zip code is 95336. The 7 p.m. showing in Manteca sold out. The 10 p.m. is about halfway sold out. And it will be moving to international soon and it'll be added showtimes so i don't know all the places it'll be internationally but it'll be added showtimes 100 percent those dates will be announced soon so march 13th will be the premiere and then you'll be able to bring your family to the added showtimes that will be probably a week later maybe a little bit less but i'll give you all the dates as soon as i get them it's exciting the movie is about well it's about all of us but specifically pastor greg Locke coming out of the baptist cessationist didn't believe in it to now sing revival and kind of how we all played a role in that and we all have a little part in the movie and it's really good and i want to just you know continue to promote this because we need deliverance in the church and so this is going to wake up a lot of churches and a lot of people that are not into or seeing deliverance anonymous thank you so much praying for i got your prayer request there the pompeys so thank you for letting the Lord use you. You and the family are in our prayers. You're a wonderful man of God. Thank you, the Pompeys. Warren and Donna, thank you so much. Said so thank you, Isaiah. I love the trailer. Thank you, Warren and Donna. Sabine from Reunion, thank you so much. I got your prayer request there. Anonymous said, my son and I love your ministry. Love your fire. Thank you so much, Anonymous. Appreciate you. <clears throat> it's going to be a great movie. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Lots of churches are going to be going that are not doing deliverance or have never seen it. And it's going to be powerful. Okay, guys, let me read the Venmo, and then we're going to hang out for just a few minutes and get off here. Because, again, I have another engagement I have to get to right after this. So, I'm not going to stay on for two and a half hours tonight. Let me look at this. Thank you to all of you giving on Venmo. Again, guys, we're not beggars. We're believers. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you for giving and partnering and monthly partnering and sewing and doing all the stuff you guys do. It means a lot. It does mean a lot. And our promise to you as you give and partner is that we'll keep doing this full time, putting out nonstop content like we're doing because that's what, you know, the giving enables us to do. Okay, Roman, thank you so much. Lyashenko, Brenda uh, De Los Santos, thank you. Tyrone Munez, thank you. William Bollock, thank you. Nara Lynn, thank you. Lisa Underwood, thank you. Melissa Eggleston, thank you so much. Barbara Martinez, thank you. Desiree Cazorla, Corzo, uh, Cazorla thank you. Mar Martin Montoya, thank you. Gary Cades, thank you. Rob Mendoza, thank you. I know I'm saying some of these wrong. Bobby Ann, thank you. Bri is, how do I say this? Brigida Betts, thank you so much. All of you giving on Venmo. My Venmo is at Isaiah Saldivar. And guys, remember, do not respond to fake uh, profiles on Facebook, on Instagram. I do not have an orphanage. I do not have a WhatsApp. I do not message you saying, beloved, God showed me this. I do not speak in broken English. So do not respond to fake accounts. I just talked to today someone that works with Instagram and they, they say I should be getting verified in the next few days, but they've been saying that. So hopefully I get the blue check soon and get verified. So that helps with the scammers, but yes, do not respond to scammers. Lucas, thank you for the, dona for the donation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, John Smith. When are you in y Yakima? I am in Yakima, which I'm probably saying that wrong. I will be in Washington. I'll tell you right now. June 17th, I'll be in Washington at the Tent Revival. July 14th through the 16th, I'll be at V1 Church in New York. Remember, March 21st, TJ will be in my studio. March 19th, TJ will be at Lifesong. Next week, we have Lonnie Frisbee's best friend on the podcast in person. Next Tuesday, 
Lonnie Frisbee's best friend on the podcast to talk about his life, the end of his life, what God did during the Jesus movement. So we had Greg Laurie on the podcast talking about the Jesus Revolution movie. Now we're going to have Lonnie Frisbee's best friend talking about Lonnie Frisbee answering questions, all that good stuff. Someone said, I got scammed. It's unfortunate. Guys, don't get scammed. Don't respond to those messages. So the next three Tuesdays, we're going to be in the new studio with guests. Well, I'll be the guest tomorrow, but I'll be being interviewed by our guest. We'll be interviewing me. But the next three weeks, we have in-person interviews at the new studio. And as you could probably guess, it's a lot more work doing the in-person studio because the person has to actually come. We have to do the in-person interview. They stay the night. They have to drive and travel. It's much easier doing them via Zoom. But I pray that you guys would would enjoy the in-person like dynamic and content and the new studio content. And I... Just be there. When it's live, be there, okay? We put a lot of time and money into it. So be there when we're live in the new studio. I would really appreciate that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, don't believe the scammers. They tell you to go on WhatsApp and they have a message for you. That's all a lie. Hopefully, we'll get verified soon. Hopefully. So we have an exciting month coming up. Very busy month this month. Exciting summer coming up, and I'm very picky on where I'm traveling. We've already received several hundred booking requests, and I've taken... Virtually none of them. I've taken like two or three of friends of mine, but yeah, I'm being very, very picky where I travel and all that. Oh, another exciting thing. We will have a vlog style red carpet video coming out, God willing, this week. So be looking forward to Thursday or Friday, God willing, our red carpet vlog video will be coming out. So you can see the red carpet, you can see the premiere, our thoughts after the movie from all the Demon Slayers in person. Yes, 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 yes. We're working on that. Isaiah's the Oprah of the church. He interviews everyone. Dude, Ryan, I'm I'm blessed, man. I've I've become that guy that gets to interview everybody, and I'm very excited about it. And you know, the beauty is, is now people are coming to me for the interviews, which is so beautiful. So like Pastor Greg Laurie, Dallas Jenkins, all of them asked me if I'd have them on. So it's beautiful that we've gotten to the point where on episode what 100 and like 30 or 40, where now speakers are asking to come on which is cool. Yes, yes, yes. So it's been fun interviewing people and it's just exciting time to be alive. It's an exciting time to be alive. You looked like a million dollars at the red carpet. Thank you, Maple Leafs. Thank you. You guys will be able to see me in a suit. The vlog will have me in a suit. It's a very rare thing. It's like seeing a unicorn, but yes, I'll be in a suit in the new video. Isaiah Salvador, love you here in Reunion Island. Oh, thank you so much. And yes, once the movie's out of theaters, it'll be on streaming platforms. I want to get it on YouTube, all right? So I don't know if I'm going to be able to. I'm going to talk to them and see what we can do. But I would love to get the documentary on YouTube eventually after the contracts are up and all that. I got the shirt from Express. Oh, this shirt, this is from my merch store. The shirt I was wearing at the red carpet or this shirt? This is from RevivalLifestyleApparel.com, which is my merch store. Where's the heart of man and spirit or soul? I believe in the soul. Okay, guys. I love you guys. It's been great. We've been live for almost two hours. We'll be live tomorrow in the studio, 6 o'clock. Be there, 6 p.m. sharp. Okay? Okay. Manteca meetup next Monday. Next Monday, we'll be at the movie theater watching the movie. So I can't go live from the theater. I can't bring a camera to the theater because they don't let you. So what are we going to do about that? I don't know, but I'll be live. I'll be out the theater next Monday at 7 p.m. And then we'll have the podcast Tuesday. So I will not be live next Monday. I'll be at the theater 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. Both showings. I probably won't stick around for the full 10 o'clock. Maybe I'll just say hi to people as they walk in. But yes, seven days away from the movie coming out in theaters. Love you guys. Appreciate you guys. And I will see you tomorrow night, six o'clock. God bless. Oh, hey, didn't see you. I was just chilling down there listening. If this, if you've enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Super easy, super free, helps a lot. All right, so right now, stop what you're doing, hit like. Okay, I'm going back down here. Bye. You heard it, ladies and gentlemen. Hit that like button. Don't be scared. Do not be scared. Hit that like button. Love you guys. Hope I can bring you a little bit of laughter and entertainment. 
If you didn't watch my short I posted today, it's funny. Go watch it. It's on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Go leave a comment. Leave a little la laughing face. I got a bunch of funny shorts from mine and my wife's podcast I'm posting. If you don't like funny shorts, guess what? I don't care because I'm still going to post them anyways. So there's that. If you don't like laughing, if you hate laughter, too bad. All I have to say is, too bad. All right, Popsicle Man out. Good night.